Okay. Wow, we're live. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Can everyone hear and see me? I hope so. Um, it's great to be back again for a, another instalment of the Our Whiskey Virtual Whiskey Festival. Thanks again so much, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, if you didn't uh, get to be with us last week, then thanks so much for coming along this week. It's oh, we've got a great great lineup for you in store today. So uh, last week we had a world whiskey tasting session with five whiskey makers who have distilleries all around the world and do blending around the world. Um, this week, if you have got a whiskey pack, if you did order one, then it's probably a bit of a giveaway that we're sticking in Scotland, seeing as all of the whiskey samples do comply with Scotch whiskey regulations and have been labelled as Scottish single malts. So bit of a giveaway. Um, listen, thank you so much for, for coming along. Guys, um, please do leave some comments, um, uh, questions for the Whiskey uh, Masters as we're going through. Um, I know that they really want to answer any questions that you have, any comments that you've got as well. Has everyone who's bought a tasting pack got their whiskies ready? Have you got your whiskies ready? I want to hear a massive yes from everybody who's got their whiskies there ready so first of all if you if you do have a whiskey um a tasting pack if you did buy a tasting pack thank you so much for all of your support really really grateful um also if you do have glasses uh ready as well for your tasting so um my preferred whiskey tasting glass is a glen cairn a bit like this which is lovely for nosing and tasting but if you don't have one of these then maybe just try a tumbler this is one of my lovely tumblers i think this is from uh, Redbreast Middleton, which is a lovely little glass. That's not a beer, by the way. That is an Irish whiskey, not Scotch. Um, so make sure you get your glasses ready. Look, look at that. Lots of yeses, lots of ready to goes. Everyone's really excited for this one. I am too. Um, okay, before we get going, before we um, get dive straight into the tasting, I um, should probably maybe introduce myself because I don't think I've done that yet. <laughs> uh, I'm Becky Paskin, co founder of Our Whiskey. Um, a lot of people have been wanting me to um, put on a certain uh, cat queen's voice and uh, say my name in the style that she would, uh, but I'm not going to do that because I'm a bit embarrassed. <laughs> um, but I, uh, so I'm the co-founder of Our Whiskey along with Georgie Bell, who's the Global Malts Ambassador for Bacardi. So we uh, founded Our Whiskey two years ago. Uh, and our whiskey is uh, essentially it's a platform to tr um, help people explore whiskey and people from all manners of backgrounds. So you might be brand new to whiskey or you might be a bit of a connoisseur. You could be a guy or a girl. You can be from anywhere in the world. We want to help you find a whiskey that you love and just help you on your journey and fall in love with whiskey like we have as well. So the Our Whiskey Festival is a, uh, a four week festival. It's running from uh, up until the 21st of May. So this is session number two. We have uh, three more sessions so this week and then two more weeks to go. Um, we wanted to uh, run a campaign, a festival, which really tries to give back to uh, people in need. So all of the profits from the Our Whiskey Festival is going to the Drinks Trust. So thank you all of you for all of your support for buying a ticket for uh, helping uh, this course. So the Drinks Trust helps people in the hospitality industry who may have fallen on hard times, particularly at the moment with what's happening with the uh, the big C word that's happening right now. Uh, I have to say a huge thank you to uh, a couple of my co-founders, uh, co-founders, um, a couple of people who've really helped us um, get the festival up and running. So thank you so much to Claxton's up in Scotland, our bottlers who have done all of the bottling for us. And also a huge thank you to the Dram team who uh, have also helped us put the whole thing together. And without them, you wouldn't have any whiskies in front of you. Even if you haven't got a tasting pack, please follow along. Um, you're going to have a great time because the couple of the, the people that I've got here, I nearly gave it away. <laughs> the people that I've got here uh, are just uh, brilliant. They're so entertaining. Ask them some fun questions. They'll give you some fun answers. Um, I think, as I said on uh, Instagram earlier today, they're probably the, the most candid personalities in Scotch. Very entertaining. So, everybody, everybody up for it? Are we ready? Oh my God, this is going to be great. Okay, guys. Oh, I forgot to say, please like and subscribe us. <laughs> subscribe to YouTube and like uh, our whiskey on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Follow along and hopefully, you know, 
follow along with the other weeks as well in the festival. Okay, that's it, that's enough. Right, I'm gonna get to it. I'm going to introduce today's guests. Please welcome, give a standing ovation and a huge round of applause for Mr. Bill Lumsden. Hi, Bill, how you doing? Hello. Good evening, Becky. What a pleasure it is to be here. Thank you for inviting me onto your, your show. Wonderful. Bill, I'm pleased to have you here. I'm also pleased to have Brendan McCarran, your sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> evening, Becky. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks, guys. I'm so pleased to have you here. Yeah. So for anyone who does not know Bill and Brendan, uh, these are the guys who are behind Glen Morangy and Ardbeg, and those are the whiskies that we're gonna be tasting today. So we've got a cracking lineup. Um, thanks to you guys, you've chosen these whiskies for us to taste through. Yeah, and it's quite interesting, Becky, when, when you introduced us there that we, we felt it was prudent to let our PR and communications team know that we were actually doing this event tonight, albeit with the cloak of secrecy over it. And one of the team sent a note saying the deadly duo ride again. But Brendan and I, we, we prefer the moniker the gruesome twosome. I think that's more appropriate for us. <laughs> Have you not ever been referred to as the flower pot man? Surely that's come up. Uh, it it's come it up has, now. It uh. has come up once or twice. And actually, Becky, you've just remembered me reminding me of a fabulous joke I have about Bill and Ben the flower pot men. Oh but God, since this is a family mic. show, I will tell you it next time I see you in person. Oh. <laughs> Trust me, you'll love it. Yeah, I prefer I the flower pot men. I'm usually called Bill's number two, but you know, that has a different oh. meaning altogether. <laughs> It might be I, I, accurate, but I prefer other ones. And I'm just actually thinking, Brendan, this is actually the first time that we've done a tasting like this together, probably for almost a year, for one reason or another. Yeah, you're right. It would be wow. it would be Alta, wouldn't it? It was, yeah. yeah the launch yeah. of number 10 in the private edition range. There you go. A first for 2020, getting the band back together. <laughs> Certainly is, yeah. And, you know, it's it's obviously very um, unusual circumstances, and we're highly delighted, Becky, that you and the team put this together, because obviously it's very important that everyone stays safe at, at this time. So, so we very much appreciate, firstly, being invited on to do this, and we appreciate the people who've logged in to see this. Yeah, I think a, a lot of people who um, may have been to a whiskey festival before know what a wonderful atmosphere that can be and how lovely it is. It's an opportunity to taste lots of different types of whiskies and discover maybe new whiskies that you never would have thought about before. So the whole idea behind um, not releasing any of the names is that it's encouraging people to uh, to give something new a go. So for anyone out there who's not tried Flamorangia and Ardbeg before, or who has maybe tried a couple but wants to maybe see a little bit more, now is your chance. So, and doing it from the comfort of your own home while being entertained by the flower pot men. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill looking extremely smart today, and Brendan, obviously, but you forgot your whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a brand new suit, though. It's a brand new suit. So, just before, just before uh, lockdown, I was in Australia and I bought three brand new suits for you know for the year because i'd need them and it turns out i won't need them so tonight is the night of debuting my new suit yes and, well, and I've, been, I've been wearing ties to to these various events becky because you know, i've got a huge collection of ties i keep buying ties and of course in the glenmorangie company in common with many companies we don't tend to wear ties anymore so i wear most of my tie collection going to bed and you know going into the bath and things <laughs> like that so i thought this was a good opportunity to wear one tonight and i am actually wearing this specific tie in honor of Brendan. Um, it's very particular color. It's by the Italian brand Mizzoni and it's very, very Celtic colors. And I thought since I'm a Rangers supporter and Brendan's a Celtic supporter, then I, I would wear this for you tonight, Brendan. Well, and then I end up putting on blue and white. So we're, we're dovetailing nicely, <laughs> but I appreciate yeah. the Celtic colors, yeah. especially as the announcement uh, for the league must be coming. Any yeah. day now, Bill. What do you think? I, Nine in a row? I, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Becky, 
moving swiftly on. <laughs> going to say, do you, do you not talk about football because... I mean, whiskey is what I, we're here for, right? Not the football. Indeed. Okay. Indeed. So, um, so everyone has um, their five whiskeys in front of them. So you'll have your wee bottles that are like this. So it's a bit bright. You might not be able to see that. There we go. Your wee bottles like that. Um, so they are numbered one, two, five. We're going to be starting off with number one and then obviously moving through to number five in case that's not clear. So... To kick us off, um, we'll start with number one. But Bill, um, it would be really cool if you could maybe run us through, like, as a blender. And you, I mean, you've been doing this for a really long time, right? Decades. Yeah. So, cer certainly, this this is my twenty fifth year with the Glen Morangy Company, and you, know, I was with Diageo, the distillers company, for ten years before that. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting used to it now. Mm. So I think, like, <laughs> in that case, as soon as now you kind of know what you're doing, um, maybe <laughs> maybe it'd be a good idea to uh, run people through who, who aren't that, um, who haven't maybe tasted whiskey that much before, or at least haven't learnt how to nose and taste whiskey properly. It'd be really nice to, to hear that from a master blender such as yourself, or rather, um, I should call you a director of whiskey stocks and distilling. Uh, my, my, my job title's too long, you know. <laughs> This it's like Prince, Prince's name, version. don't worry about it. <laughs> it's the short version. <laughs> so how do you make the taste, Bill? Right, okay. So, no, it's a very, very interesting question and very topical question because earlier on this week, I did a little interview over the phone with the wonderful Ian Vishnevsky, the journalist and writer and vodka and spirits expert. And one of the things I said to Ian was, you need to bear in mind that what I will tell you is the way I do it, and it's not necessarily the way Richard Patterson would do it, for example, or Jim Beveridge at Diageo, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's very important to, to find your own way of doing it. But, you know, obviously, if you're doing it professionally for a living, then you do need to have a, a fairly standard protocol. So I, I was highly delighted to see, Becky, you showing the, the Glen Cairn glass. It's a wonderful glass to use, and I do often use the Glen Cairn glass myself. However, when, when Brendan and I... In, and the team are working in our sensory laboratory, we do tend to use our own glasses. So, you know, this is an example of our tulip-shaped Glenmorangie glass. Um, very beautiful, very elegant, but more importantly, it does the same job as the Glen Cairn glass does. And a, a little interesting aside here, and this is the first aside of the evening, the first tangent of many, no doubt, but um, I sometimes use the, the Riedel malt whiskey glass. And Riedel, of course, have developed a fabulous range of tasting glasses, you know, one specific for Burgundy, for Bordeaux, for Rhone, et cetera, et cetera. And they all work really well. And the Riedel glass is fabulous for drinking whiskey because it's got this unique little lip and it spreads the whiskey out over your palate. However, for what we do in the laboratory, where we're actually using our noses as much as our palates, you need something a bit more like this with a tulip shape. So if, if, if you're serious about wanting to find all of the complexity of flavor, uh, a tulip shaped glass like this, rather than a traditional whiskey tumbler is probably better. So the first thing I always do is that I'll have a look at the color of the whiskey. But you need to be careful here because it might tell you something about the, the whiskey. And in the case of the five whiskies we've got to taste tonight, the color absolutely does tell you something about how it, the whiskies have been made. But you need to bear in mind that very dark colored whiskey might be dark because of other reasons. So the color can be a bit of a red herring. The first thing I do is I will always nose my whiskey straight up. I'll nose it neat. And I'll do this whether it's at standard bottling strength of 40 to 43, or if it's slightly higher, like some of the whiskies we're tasting tonight, which are 46 and above. And even if it's cask strength whiskey, I will always start by nosing at full strength. 
And, you know, keep your mouths open if you can while you're doing this. Get the vapours into contact with as many of your sensory receptors as possible, even although you may look like a goldfish while you're doing it. But it just gives you more of the impact of the aroma, the bouquet of the whiskey. The next thing I will do is I will then cut my whiskey with a splash of water and then I'll nose it again and just see how the aroma is developing, how the bouquet is opening up. If it's a cask strength whiskey I have, I will then generally add another splash of water. But it's very important not to drown the whiskey here. And I tend to uh, end up with maybe five parts whiskey to one part water in my glass. Now, I know in a lot of professional tasting laboratories, people will not actually taste the whiskey until it's reduced right down to 20% alcohol by volume. But from a personal perspective, I think you lose a lot of the mouthfeel or the texture of a whiskey. So I say that's why I do it that way. Nose it neat, cut it with a little bit of water, and then nose it for a second time. Finally, and, and, sorry, and Becky, question here. No, no, we're just like sitting here like nudging dogs, like, yep, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Take me that. Brendan, you're, 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 you're doing very well, Bill. You're doing very well. Keep going. Thank, thank you, sir. You're very kind. As, as long as you're not sitting there falling asleep, Becky. So <laughs> the next thing I will do is I will then take a small sip of the whiskey. You know, just enough to get my, my palate ready for the onslaught of flavour so that's going to come. And, you know, I'll, I'll think about the primary flavour. Is the whiskey sweet? You know, is it slightly bitter, perhaps? Is it woody? Just get a, an initial impression of the flavours in there. Once I've done that, I will then take a much bigger sip of the whiskey and I will generally hold it in my mouth for a few seconds. Now, some people will tell you, you need to hold the, the, the whiskey in your mouth for, you know, if, if it's a 20-year-old whiskey, hold it in your mouth for 20 seconds before swallowing. In my humble opinion, that's marketing bullshit. You really don't need to do that. But, you know, hold it in for a few seconds, then swallow. The first thing I think of then is what is the texture of the whiskey like? What is the mouth feel? Is it spicy? Is it peppery? Is it fiery? Is it smooth? Is it creamy? And then I'll start to think of the primary flavours of the whiskey. Now, probably at least 20 to 30 seconds have elapsed by then. So I will then treat myself, give myself a second opinion and take a second big sip of the whiskey. And then I'll really start to drill down into detail and think about some of the individual flavours. So uh, as I say, Becky, not everyone does it in the same way as me, but that's what works for me. And, you know, over many, many years of trial and error, that's the way I like to do it. Good. I think, you know, it, it's great to hear how a blender approaches uh, the nosing and the tasting of the whiskey. I think for a lot of people, if you are just kicking back at the end of the day and you're pouring yourself a dram and you just want to sit and enjoy that whiskey, just enjoy it whichever way you want. There is no hard and fast rule to you have to nose and taste it for however length of time, certainly not necessarily 20 seconds to sit it in your palate before you can actually swallow it and enjoy it. Just whatever, whatever works for you. Yeah. Um, guys, I, I, as, you as you know, Becky, I, I, I said at the start, I have been sipping on my Glenmorangie original, a whiskey cooler here with freshly squeezed lime juice and some ginger beer in it. But, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go through the, the, the whole sequence I just described there for that. I'll just sip and enjoy that. Absolutely. Um, we've got, so everyone seems to be, I can see everyone's comments coming in and they are chomping at the bit to find out what this first whiskey is. So they've obviously gone ahead and tasted it with that wonderful uh, technique that you were just talking about. So we're going to have to go in and, and, and tell them all about it. Um, who, which one of you is going to take the first one? Yep. I don't it, think it, you've worked out your orders. So. Yeah, it, it's, it, <laughs> yep. Be, believe it or not, for once, Brendan and I did a little bit of preparation this evening. About 30 <laughs> seconds, Brendan, I think. Yeah, proud of yep. us. I'm so proud. 
Yeah. So, so I'm going to go first with a uh, whiskey number one, which is, of course, the magnificent and uh, very well-known mm. Glenmorangie original. And you know, it, I I was very keen to do this in particular for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, it is the Glenmorangie Company's flagship expression. It's the most popular expression in the range. Secondly, I think it's the one which really does encapsulate the true house character or DNA of, of Glenmorangie whiskey. You know, distilled with very, very lightly peated barley, mineral rich spring water, distillation in the tallest stills in Scotland and maturation in hand selected American oak. So th th this is the archetypal Glenmorangie whiskey, but from a very, very personal, and that's an, a, an image of the, the stills you can see there, from a very personal perspective, th this, this was actually the very first single malt scotch whiskey I ever tasted way back in my student days. And it was that first taste which basically drew me in to the world of, of whiskey and probably pretty much determined that that's where I saw my career path lying. So, you know, it's a, it's a very, very dear whiskey to me. It's a great favourite. And of course, it is the building block of the rest of the Glenmorangie range. So, uh, Glenmorangie original, uh, aged for at least 10 years and you know the Glenmorangie company has always bottled a single malt at this age for many many years and we believe that at that age the combination of the delicacy and the fragrance from the new make spirit and the gentle influence of the American oak wood. We use, it's 100% American X bourbon barrels we use for Glenmorangie original. The combination of these two things together, I think just gives a really beautiful, bright, sparkling, delicious whiskey. And it's a whiskey that is very easy to drink. It's very versatile. You know, you can have it straight up. You can add a bit of water, add some soda, and you can even have it the way I was having it uh, earlier on this evening. And I have to admit, I deliberately chose this because I was doing a tasting event last night with Richard Patterson, and I knew how much this would upset Richard to see me doing this to, to, to Scotch whiskey. And, you know, he, he didn't disappoint me. He had a little dig at me about it. But for this evening's tasting, of course, we're, we're not going to do it this way. So I'm going to hold my glass right up to the, the lens of my PC camera. And you can see this is a lovely, natural, bright gold color. So this is the color that's been leached out of these heavily toasted American oak X bourbon barrels over 10 years. And it's lovely and bright and sparkling. Bottled at 40 or 43% alcohol, depending on your market. So let's just start by gently swirling and start to inhale the bouquet of the whiskey. It's a very, very clean, very fresh bouquet. And as Brendan will testify with Glenmorangie original, because it's so delicate, so fresh and clean, if anything has ever gone wrong in the production process, we pick it up immediately. So we're always looking for this lovely freshness, this lovely delicacy. Now, if I was standing up in my feet here, instead of being seated at my kitchen table, I might <laughs> gaily skip round about to, to try and demonstrate me metaphorically skipping through a meadow or an orchard in the summertime or something like that. And okay, I'm getting a little bit bullshitty here, but it's just to try and say there's all these lovely, delicate, fragrant flavours. Makes me think of apple, of pear, of honey, some nice floral notes in there. We want to hear. We want to hear what um, all you guys out there are, are getting from the whiskey as well. So, what what are you smelling in your glass, and and what are you tasting as well? So, um, join. This is an interactive tasting. I want to hear. We want to hear everything that you're that you're experiencing as well. So, leave a comment, and and we'll we'll, we'll read some of those out as well as we're going through. Bill, I, I, I love that. Yep. I, love I that. always. 
love that bit, Becky, in a live tasting where you open it up to the audience and say, well, what do you smell? And you know, almost always someone will say whiskey. And I think, well, that's yeah. good. That's a good start. I'm glad you <laughs> smell that because it actually is whiskey. Well, it's it's funny you say that because I, I've seen that my uh, my big brother is actually watching this as well, and that's one of the quips that he would have come up with, I'm sure. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, if you're watching, too bad. It's already been done. <laughs> so, big brother is watching you. Mm. Um, but I, I love that about walking through an orchard. Loads of um, lovely uh, apple. For me, it's fresh apple. It's it's a crunchy, crisp green yeah. apple. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lovely kind of um, lemony citrusness to it as well. Nice and vibrant and and fresh. It's a it's a lovely spring or summer whiskey and perfect drunk. How you have it in your in your lovely tumbler there, Bill? With um, mm. is it ginger you have it with? So, so, sorry, is it gin? What what's in your glass? Ginger and lime. It, it, it's actually old Jamaica ginger beer, and then I squeezed half a lime into it, and it works equally well with ginger ale. It's just very refreshing, and the ginger and the lime flavours beautifully complement the whiskey. And, you know, I know that there will be some whiskey purists listening tonight who might be absolutely horrified at that. But as I say, it's a very versatile whiskey. And in the Scotch whiskey industry, we're a little bit more relaxed about how people should enjoy the product. Yeah. And okay, last night, Richard Patterson was not. But, you know, he, he, <laughs> as, as, as the godfather of the industry, he's allowed to take that stance. I think he's allowed to do what he wants. Um, so here, here you go. Uh, there's the big bro chiming in. It tastes of whiskey. Of course it does. Um, oh, this is an interesting note. Play-Doh on the nose. I, I absolutely get that, that kind of sweet waxiness in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tabitha, Tabitha says, it's more malty than I remember. Um, but she also has very fruity. She gets honeysuckle, green apple, honey, a touch of vanilla, and some citrus. Reminds her of a crisp German white wine. Yeah, I, oh I'm God. loving these notes and every single thing you said there, maybe not the Play Doh, mm -hmm. but every single thing you said there is actually in the official tasting mm -hmm. notes. Now, what I'm going to do here, and um, I may well get my wrist slapped by my friends in marketing here because. Look, horror of horrors, I'm using an Ardbeg water jug for a Glenmorangie whiskey. Yeah. Mate, as long as there's water in there, Bill, you'll be fine. Don't tell anyone. If it's anyone. got Ardbeg 10 in it, you're in trouble. Yeah, that, that, that wouldn't work so well, Brendan. <laughs> so now, with just a little splash of water, the whiskey's absolutely burst into life. And these citrus notes you mentioned, Becky, I'm getting lots of that in there, the zesty lemon and lime. But also there is that sort of malty base of the whiskey. And I'm interested that, that one of our listeners there said it's a bit more malty that, than she remembers it. And, you know, it's something we always look for in the whiskey. Always in the background, but it's definitely there. Mm. Mm. So, of I like course... It's, it's, I, think it's, I think a lot of people don't, um, well, there's a lot of myths around whether you should or shouldn't add water to whiskey. So if you're if you're quite new to whiskey and you're not really sure how it should be drunk, um, really it's what, whatever way you prefer it. So it's like always try and sip it neat as, as Bill said at the, at the beginning, but add a drop of water just to open it up. And, and that's the way that blenders always approach it. So yeah. I think it's, and, and that releases a lot of the fruitiness. Um, and, and, and as Bill said, some of that um, lovely, those lovely citrus notes as well. We, we, we call it releasing the serpent in the industry. And if you ever have the opportunity, yes, it's a, it's a nice thought that, Becky, I know. I love the look in your face there. But if you ever have the opportunity to try that with new make spirit, it's quite remarkable how that changes. It's almost like an explosion in the glass. And when Brendan and I are doing this with Glenmorangie and you make, you get all of these lovely apple and pear notes coming through once the water's added. Mm, mm, definitely. So, I've, got, um, I've got a lovely question here from, from our friend Sam Simmons, um, who uh, works over at Boutique Whiskey Company. I'm already um, worried, Becky. I'm already worried. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question, Sam. Who is more likely to skip through a meadow, Bill or Brendan? <laughs> <laughs> Brendan, did they have meadows in Coatbridge where you were brought up? Say, more likely to skip through a mine. <laughs> <laughs> Either a coal mine or a landmine in Coatbridge. Yeah. 
Come to think of it, where I was brought up in Greenock, you know, there weren't too many meadows either. <laughs> not, not the most green <laughs> or plate pastures either. <laughs> I think it depends. So I, I, who's, I, who's had more whiskey would probably be the answer. Who's had more whiskey at Glenmorangie House is the one that's going to go through the meadow first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, probably, but by merit of my age more than anything else, Brendan, that would have to be me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Guys, um, with a with a quick yes or no, like who enjoyed the Glenmorangie original, um, and who's maybe not had it yes. before? Obviously, yes, the three of us. <laughs> uh, but uh, leave a comment. Let us know what you thought of that. Um, but we're going to move on uh, in a second. I'm guessing it's Brendan's turn. Yes, Please Brendan will be talking about the, the next whiskey now. Just before we move on, Becky, can I just say that I hope everyone found the marvellous, soft, creamy texture you find in Glen Orangey original, you know, as a result of these lovely American oak casts. So that lovely, buttery, creamy flavour. So, flagship expression Glen Orangey original. Brendan. Over to me. So the next one that we're going to try together, uh, so I, I, I was trying to set the stage with giraffes who are unofficial symbol of Glenmorangie but the next whiskey that we're tasting and not to keep the football theme going but I'm guessing Bill gave this to me because it is in green and white so very much in Celtic <laughs> colours <laughs> you know the league's coming Bill accept it but <laughs> the next whiskey we're going to try together is Glenmorangie Quinta Ruban Quinta Ruban is our port finished whiskey so you can see it up on screen right there um, this port finished whiskey is, it really is something special. Um, it's been around for a little while, but just recently, so in the last year, it's changed a little bit. So I know that there's maybe some people on here who are brand new to Glenmorangie, so I'll try and bring that to life. But there's probably quite a lot of people on here who have tried the old Glenmorangie Kinteruban and want to know what's changed. So this right here is... Uh, a finish, it's a play on that classic Glenmorangie original that Bill just tasted. And, and it's one that I love. And the first thing I love about it, it's using ruby red port cast from Portugal. Um, and th the first thing that they do is they create that color. So this color is just ridiculous. It's almost <laughs> purple, which is a great Scottish word to say if you have a Scottish accent. It's purple, purple. It's pink. Yeah, purple. Anything with rolling R's and it's purple, purple. it's pink. It, see how it just goes a little bit pink? It bleeds out pink towards the edges. And it has some of this sort of burnished copper and orange. So you know you know for a fact you're drinking a single malt scotch because it was labelled that way. But the colour is kind of distinct. I'm going to say it's unique in the scotch whisky industry to have this sort of colour in the glass. And it doesn't always tell you how a whisky is going to taste, just like Bill said. But with this one, it actually has a good marker for what's going to come. So with this, you're looking at the first the first 10 years of its life is probably going to be similar to Glenmorangie original. So the first 10 years, we're going to put it in hand-selected ex-bourbon casks, bringing out that fruity and floral nature of Glenmorangie, adding some of the vanilla, adding that, that creamy, buttery texture, and giving just that little hint of spice, something gingery or clove sort of uh, spiced in there. But at that stage, not all of it, but we start to change the recipe. We start to introduce new flavours. So some of the whiskey is going to be transferred into ruby red port casks for what is called wood finishing. You know, a process that's basically been uh, dominated, pioneered and led by Dr. Bill. Um, and it's something that just adds extra layers of aroma, extra layers of flavour, extra layers of texture. And I guess if you add them all up in some kind of mathematical equation it equals complexity so with the port let's do it together take that color and start to think in your head what what's what's that color going to represent what's it going to come out as this flavor when we try this quinta ruban for a long time it's been a 12 year old whiskey very recently we have updated the recipe and we've updated the age so it's now minimum 14 years in the in the cask so just it's at 46 percent as well so with these glasses, you want to give it a little swirl to kind of wake up the liquid, yeah. but don't go crazy. Don't swirl it too hard. Don't give it and too Br much. Brendan, can I, can I just ask you a wee question there? Yeah. 
Just, just. Um, I mean, obviously, I know the answer, but just you touched on something there about the move from twelve to fourteen years old, and that was quite an interesting challenge for us. So maybe you want to say a little bit more about that. Is that okay, Becky? Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. one of the questions I had as well. What was behind yeah. the decision to yeah. increase that age by a couple of years? Yeah. So, so for the people who are more familiar with the whiskey, um, you'll you'll know about the twelve-year-old Quinta that's been around for quite a long time. And you might ask, why did you upgrade to 14? Why did you update to 14? Um, the 12-year-old was 10 years in ex-bourbon casks and two years in ruby red port casks, and that made the 12-year-old keen to reban. So a lot of people, and it's, it's fair enough to, you know, try and work it out and make the assumption that now it's 10 years in ex-bourbon and it's four years in ruby port. But that's not the case. If, if that was the case, the colour would go a much deeper kind of, orange peel and uh, caramelized orange and also the flavor would become more intense in the kind of port notes that we pick up from the cask yeah. so when we made this whiskey 14 years we were really trying to keep the distinction keep the perfect flavor and keep the brilliant balance that's always existed in came to ruban so these days really it tastes very similar it tastes just as brilliant as the 12 year old tasted but it's definitely more I guess you could say it's more appealing to the eye when it sits on a shelf because it's now 14 years instead of 12 years. And we kept, which was a pretty bold decision in the whiskey industry and really well received, but we've kept the price exactly the same. So you're now getting a, a whiskey that's two years older, tastes every bit as amazing as the 12-year-old, the possibly a little bit more developed in the, the orange and dark chocolate flavours that we're going to find, but it's the same price. So it's it's, it's been like a... It's been like a real hit over the last year and it's been really well received. Yeah. I, I, I'm seeing, even without my reading glasses on, Becky, because of the reflection of the screen, I'm seeing some of the comments coming through there and a lot of red delicious apple coming up, which yeah. I totally agree with on, on the nose of this. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. Rachel, that, that's a great taste to note. I get a ton of red apple. The same Tabitha, I think, said exactly the same thing. Yeah. And that yeah. lovely chocolatey chocolatiness comes to you. Is that is that from the port cast, that red apple and port um red apple and chocolate kind of notes? Are they all coming from the port cask? So I would say that the, the red apple is I would say it's it's, it's kind of encouraged, it's kind of brought out by the port cask. So almost like, you know, if you add salt to certain foods, it makes certain flavours pop out. So I think that citrusy white fruit flavour is in Glenmorangie and the cast have really encouraged it to come out. Mm. Now, the chocolate, I, I get dark chocolate. You know, I get mm. like this sort of really um, high cocoa, um, high quality dark chocolate. That absolutely is coming more so from the port cast. That, that's yeah. encouraged out by those casts in a big mm. way. I've got, there's a great yeah. question here from, from Tabitha, actually. She says, would you mature exclusively in port casks or do you feel that finishing is better? Yeah, so I'll answer yeah. this quickly and then I'm definitely going to hand over to Bill because he's been doing it for a lot longer. <laughs> um, I think if you matured fully in port, I think we could make a great whiskey, but it would be less consistent. So I think you could get a single cask that's had 14 years in port and you know what? There'd maybe be 10 of them or 100 of them laid down, but one or two would jump out and you'd go, those are incredible but at Glenmonji it's all about complexity and it's about balance and if you went exclusively to port I think you would actually you take away from the whiskey you would take away the complexity you would take away the discovery and you would take away actually you take away quite a lot of that house style the distillery character yeah. and you kind of drown it out yeah. but Bill, so that, 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 you? that's that's your final comment there, Brendan, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. And as you know, we do have a very, very small number of old whiskies which have been in port casks for their entire life. And, you know, they're totally fascinating and quite delicious whiskies, but they're not really representative of the Glenmorangie style. And that unique DNA has almost been completely masked by, by the onslaught of flavour from the ruby port wine. So that, that's why, as Brendan said, we, 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 we like this technique of finishing our extra maturation. And it's, it. it's also it's also the reason for the strength. It's also the reason for the ABV being at forty six percent. So it's higher than the original, but we choose the strengths to bring out the two 
dimensions, you know, the flavour of the distillery and the flavour of the cask. Mm. One of the things I'm loving about the, the Quinta Ruban is that on the nose, it's quite sweet and fruity and floral. On the taste, it's altogether more savoury. Now, of course, you get the fruits in there as well, but I'm loving this kind of slightly musky, savoury thing and all the dark chocolate mm. in there. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like dark chocolate and then oxidation. I know oxidation yeah. isn't a flavour, but all these kind of oxidised wines and yeah. it's like a slightly balsamic flavour that comes through. Yeah. I'm seeing mm. dark chocolate and cherry That's with a good. CH, not sherry as in the wine, and I totally agree with that. Great eyesight, yeah. girl. Without you my know, glasses, that's impressive, eh? You know, you're, you're, kind of, you're kind of channeling your, your inner British Airway pilot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just because you're missing travelling exactly, so much. Exactly, that's exactly what's happening here. Having not travelled now for quite some time in common with all of us, I'm trying to pretend I'm a fighter pilot here with my headset on. <laughs> and you're proving you've got the 2020 vision as well by reading those super small comments. And you're, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so you're certain right. about that. <laughs> or um, a British Airways pilot, or as Rachel says, Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't me. think there's too many people out there tonight who would mistake me for Britney Spears. Well, if your hair grows much longer, Bill, without that Ooh. haircut. Yeah. That's very that. true. Yep. And, you always um, have that schoolgirl uniform, Bill, that you could put to use. And you've just led me straight into it, Becky. If my hair grows much longer, um, I don't think yours is going to grow much longer anytime soon, Brendan, right? Just, just, just here. Just let the Terry Nopkins look if I'd stopped cutting it. <laughs> On that note, um, shall we move into number three? Whiskey Can I just say two last things about this whiskey? One yes. thing is, if you're loving it at full strength, then then carry on drinking it. But if you add water to it, it kind of becomes it becomes really floral, but in a good way, this sweet floral soapy thing starts to happen. Mm. So you almost get like some Turkish delight. And you'll get a little bit of black currant and a little bit of black cherry starting mm. to appear. Uh, it also makes, I think, the best old fashioned on earth is if you make it yeah. with to Ruban. And it, last thing, and then I'm done, I swear. Um, if anyone's picking up smoke, we get that quite often. Maybe one in 20 people at a, a whiskey masterclass will say, oh, it's a little bit smoky. Has this one got some phenols in it? And it hasn't. It's just, it's just something. I don't know what the exact answer is. It's something to do with the wood tannins. The, the ruby red port and how it plays that just occasionally people think mm. it's just lightly smoky mm. yeah I, I think it's actually there are some phenolic compounds in there but i think they are wood derived polyphenols mm -hmm. rather than peat smoke because of course yeah. the malted barley for most you know 99 percent of the whiskies we make at glenmorangie are almost unpeated Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll, we'll be moving on to some Peter Whiskey with Ardbeg um, in a bit. We do have one more from Glenmorangie, which um, I don't think includes any peated malt. Is that right? No. no the, 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 so, some of the base whiskies in there, Becky, are just, you know, peated to a very, very minimal level like the rest of the whiskies. You know, a maximum of two ppm phenol for all the whiskey geeks out there, which, you know, to all intents and purposes is virtually unpeated. That's the Glenmorangie House style. Mm -hmm. For people who are asking how much um, these whiskies are, what I'll be doing at the very end of the tasting is just adding some links into where you can purchase them from um, in the comments. So if you hang on until the end of the video, so we'll be going until about half past seven. So uh, just, just hang with us and I'll add some links in so you can um, head off and, and purchase those. So I'll stop by most good retailers. Um, <laughs> Uh, on the PPM um, and, and with phenols, obviously that's um, a sign of how peaty whiskey is. So a low number means not very peaty. And at, at two, you're barely going to taste much smoke. Um, and a lot a lot of whiskies will um, peat their malt up to quite a high PPM um, in the 60s or even 70s, um, which is pretty smoky. So that there's a quite a range, quite a difference, isn't there? Um, but you guys... Yeah, there's a difference and there's also different ways in which you can measure the phenols. So it can be quite controversial, but, you know, mm. we, 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 we are just so happy to be invited on here, Becky. Brendan, I'm not going to be too controversial tonight. <laughs> so. 
If and you're not was, controversial, then I don't think we'd have achieved any goals. <laughs> and, and it, it was not lost on me there, Becky, when you talked about the timing of this. You said we're going to be going on to about 7.30. And that was clearly directed at Brendan and I to say, remember, guys, you know, Set you've got watch. a time limit here. Yeah, to be honest, it was more of a reminder because I can, in this um, perpetual um, non-existential coronavirus lockdown time warp that we're in, I had no idea what time it was. Yeah, no, <laughs> in the of all of it. So it's more of a reminder to myself. To yeah. be fair. Um, but saying that, um, let's move on to whiskey number three. So who are we going back to for that? Uh, you're, you're going back to myself for this one. Ooh, and so definitely. whiskey number three is the incredible innovative Glenmorangie Signet. Now, obviously, as, as you know in particular, Becky, I could wax lyrical about this for the next four to five hours. People might not thank me for that, so I'm going to try and give a very succinct description of this product and how it all came about. So the, the, the genesis of it goes right back to my student days. And at round about the same time as I was discovering things like wine and malt whiskey, I also became interested in, you know, tea and coffee and good food. You know, I, I, I was a typical student in these days who basically had desires way above his budget, <laughs> like most students tend to have. And my pal Ian and I, occasionally, we really did have ideas above our station. And because we were both big fans of the James Bond novels, so this is the books by Ian Fleming as opposed to the films, um, in, in the books, James Bond occasionally drank Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee. So Ian and I thought, well, that's great. We're going to drink this too and sort of live the same lifestyle as James Bond. Ha <laughs> ha. But one of the things that really struck me was that after shelling out substantial amounts of our meagre student grants to buy Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee beans. While we did enjoy the subtle taste of it, I, I, I couldn't help thinking that I was ever so slightly disappointed in it. And you know, that's a theme that's kind of lived with me throughout all of my life, that the aroma of coffee is beautifully beguiling. There's a great promise in there, but I find when you come to taste it, to me, it never quite lives up to that earlier promise. So being somebody who is either interested in something completely or not interested at all. I started to study where the coffee beans came from and how the roasting of the beans could bring out different flavors. Now, at that same time, I had discovered malt whiskey. And as you know very well, Becky, Glenmorangie 10 year old was my first. Balveni 10 year old founders reserve, as it was known in that time was my second. Lagavulin, 12-year-old, was my third. And I have to say that was quite a shock to my young, <clears throat> delicate palate in these days. But so the, the, the idea of how malt whiskey is made and how coffee beans are roasted kind of merged together. And I had this silly idea that instead of the barley being dried over the traditional Scottish peat fire, wouldn't it be fun if the barley was roasted in a coffee roasting drum? And, you know, it was just a little idea at the time, which I kind of forgot about. And it wasn't really until I joined the Glenmorangie company at the beginning of 1995 that I decided to try and resurrect idea and actually do something about it. Now, the most mash tons in Scotland, even the smallest ones, you're talking about them holding, you know, maybe two or three tons, uh, which is two or 3,000 kilograms of malted barley. And some of the bigger distilleries, the, the mash tons can be right up to 12 tons. So to try and process that quantity of malted barley through a little coffee roasting drum was just not going to be practical at all. So using my knowledge of and love of craft beer, 
I know that this is going back to the, the, the 1980s. I was a particular fan of dark beer like stout or porter. So I knew that the, the, the barley for these, the malted barley was roasted in a giant drum. So I put two and two together and we bought some batches of what's known as high roast chocolate malt and experimented with it at the Glenmorangie Distillery. So once the first batches of the spirit from the high roast chocolate malt had reached a particular age, you know, around about 10 to 12, we decided to taste it in a bit more detail. And I have to say, I was ever so slightly disappointed with the result because that whiskey on its own was very, very bitter sweet and it was much more espresso coffee style. So I spent quite a bit of time in the laboratories with my team uh, in these days, which included Rachel Barry, who was very heavily involved in the recipe for this. And we finally came up with a recipe which we believed brought out the best of, of the, the chocolate malt whiskey. So that was launched in 2008 as Glenmorangie Signet. And, you know, hats off to my friends in our marketing department, who I think did a wonderful job designing a bottle which beautifully reflects the character of the whiskey. So Signet has been available for nearly 12 years now, and it is one of the more inconsistent whiskies we have in the Glenmorangie range. It's a very complicated recipe, the heart of which is the whiskey from the chocolate malt. We use American oak bourbon barrels, we use Spanish sherry casks, we use virgin charred oak barrels. So there's a lot of different things going on in the recipe of this and it's kind of an ever-evolving product. But I think, to be honest, and Brendan will back me up here, the most surprising thing to me about this is that even after 12 years, I really haven't seen too many more whiskies, certainly coming from Scotland, to be made using the chocolate malt. So it's still something quite unique. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't surprise me at all, actually, because I'm only a few years with Glenmorangie and I've worked at several distilleries. It's madness if you're a distillery manager to yeah. switch yeah. off. You get you have to switch a distillery off once a year for the boiler. Once you get it back up and running, you're like, do not interfere. You know, do not touch it. Just let it run through until the next time I have to switch off. So to go down, <laughs> introduce high roast chocolate malt, do something completely different in the middle of production is, it seemed like madness before I joined here. And then when I joined Glenmondry Company, it's, yeah. it's it's something we do. There's, so, a, there's an interesting related question to that actually, Brendan, as well, that's um, that's come in from, uh, oh, it's just as bit Alex Beckwith, um, who says, how often is Signet made at Glenmondry Distillery? <laughs> so you, are having, you are having to shut off and then <laughs> pick things back up again. How often do you do this? Too, too often for the distillery manager's liking, to yes. be honest, Becky. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> typically once a year we do that. And, you know, it's because you have to shut down, you have to separate out the faints from the classic Glenmorangie and blah, blah, blah. And it's very difficult to process. The chocolate malt itself disintegrates into powder in the mill which limits the actual quantity you can put into the mash tun. So we certainly couldn't do a mash with 100% chocolate malt. It just wouldn't work. So mm. it's blended together with classic malted barley. Mm. So, yeah, you yeah. know, the, the lovely dark colour of this, um, a lot of people think, oh, that must be the chocolate malt that gives it that. But in fact, the spirit, when it's distilled, even although the warts and the fermented wash is black, like a vat of Guinness. Once it's distilled, it's colourless, like classic new make spirit. So the dark colours in Signet come from the use of sherry casks and the virgin charred oak. So we bottle this at 46% ABV, the same as the Quinta Ruban, because it's non-chill filtered. And on the nose, of course, you'll get a hint of these lovely mocha coffee chocolate flavours. Again, mm. I'm going to release my serpent, just a few drops. And I'm sure, I can't see Becky at the moment, but I'm sure you shuddered once again at that description, Becky. But a few oh, drops of water. 
and it's just really brought out these simmering coffee notes. Mm. And if you take a sip, if you didn't <clears throat> quite get the coffee and chocolate on the nose, you absolutely get this on the taste of this. Mm. Rachel, Rachel Dixon says, divine, chocolate, malt, a slight medicinal smell, maybe sarsaparilla. Uh, it reminds me of a, a bit of a white Russian. Mm. And, you know, this is going to sound a ridiculous description. These are great descriptors, by the way, Rachel. There's almost a crackle in the mouth when you taste this. It has a very, very unique texture to it. And there's an almost explosion of flavours. I and mean, it's lovely, bitter, sweet flavours. The mocha, the coffee, the chocolate, the tiramisu, a bit of vanilla, some bittersweet, tangy orange in there. There's an awful lot going on in the glass of Signet. Yeah. So obviously we are very proud of this in the Glenmorangie company and it still is arguably one of the most unusual innovations in the Scotch whisky industry. Yeah, there are there are um, a, a handful of distilleries that uh, have been playing about with roasted barley's more so now. I mean, you guys released it released Signet quite some time ago. Um, yeah, two thousand and eight. So to, to release something at that point means you've been working with roasting your malts for a considerable time before that. So um, in the last couple of years, we've seen a few releases from some Scotch whisky producers that do include some roasted barley, so chocolate malt, coffee malt, um, and some with pale malt as well. So the likes of Eden Mill um, in Fife, who, uh, which is originally mm -hmm. a brewery, and now they're a distillery as well. So they're releasing some of their whiskies mm -hmm. with, with some roasted barley. And Balveni as well released um, recently, a, 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 I think it's called the Day of Dark Barley, um, which references the fact that they bring in um, a, a, a delivery of uh, roasted malt mm -hmm. and pork their particular expression so there are a few but it's still quite rare i think there's a lot more um exploration of roasted malt which are typically used to make beer so different types yeah, of yeah, ale and yeah. ale ale, um now being used in whiskey and there's more um more examples of that in american whiskey yeah. than there is um in in scotland at the moment yeah. but there are a few they're coming, yeah. they're coming. Yeah. but obviously yeah. We have to wait for them because yeah. this takes time yeah. to mature. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the really cool things about Signet is when you're asked, so when you do a whiskey tasting, a masterclass of these Glenmorangies, they ask, well, what's original like? And you can name several whiskies. If you like that, you'll like this. What's keen to like? You can mention some Fort Finnish whiskies. But when people fall in love with Signet, which they always do, and they say, so what else is like Signet? And you're like, nothing. <laughs> it's yeah. Nothing. Yeah. It and it's in, it, interesting, Becky, that you mentioned American whiskies there mm. because the one whiskey I've tasted that really does make me yeah. think of Signet is um, was from Westland Distillery mm. near Seattle in the United States. And you know, having spoken to the team there, they 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 they, they did admit that they were inspired a bit by by um, Signet. So. Oh. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot more innovations like that to come from the Scotch whiskey industry. But yeah, Signet is kind of the, the problem child in the Glenmorangie range. And, you know, a long time ago, I gave up trying to keep this product totally consistent. And the fact that it's made in small batches, it just isn't. So I, I think we celebrate the inconsistency and you get batch to batch variations. Sometimes it's much more of the deep, dark coffee flavours. Sometimes it's a bit more like sweet chocolate. Mm. Mm. I think it's a wonderful whiskey, something just a little bit different from uh, some from, from other other whiskies that you have, particularly within the Glenmorangie range. It really stands out as being um, quite exceptional and quite unique. So a really lovely example of taking that Glenmorangie DNA and then manipulating it to, to extract different types of flavours, all while still having that undercurrent of all of that lovely orchard fruit that's still there as well. So. Yeah, really lovely one. It seems like everyone loves this one as well. The comments yeah. that are coming in are, are exceptional. I guess you two are used to hearing such praise for Signet all the yeah. time. Yeah, I, I've never met anyone who I've introduced it to who didn't like it, Becky, unless it was someone who just did not like spirits at all. Mm -hmm. I um I actually randomly found uh, a bottle of Signet uh, at the back of my shelf the other day, so I was extremely pleased. What <laughs> um, luck. Yeah. I know, yeah. I know. Um, great. My well, happiest I... happiest moment ever was a new hotel opened in Stirling where I live, and they were they had a whiskey bar, and it was five pounds for a bottle of Glenmorangie. Sorry for a a, a measure of Glenmorangie <laughs> original, 
and I asked for it, and the guy came out with a bottle of Signet, and I went, oh, no, 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 that'll be more expensive. So we checked the till, and he went, you're right, sir, it is more expensive. It's 50 pence more expensive. <laughs> so I had a quadruple, and then I had another quadruple, and then it was a fun night. It was a fun, fun night. Would it be right in saying, Brendan, that hotel in Stirling no longer has Signet? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Possibly could be true. <laughs> Oh, well, guys, I'm really glad you have enjoyed the Glamorangie. You've tried three um, very uh, different expressions. So obviously the Glamorangie original there was number one. Uh, number two was the Kinta Ruban, uh, the 14-year-old, which is finished in those lovely fruity, chocolatey port casks. Uh, and then number three was the Glamorangie Signet, which has that lovely coffee and a lot of black tea notes. Um, people were, were talking about a lot of black tea and bitter black tea, which is, which is quite cool. Um, we're going to be moving away from Glenmorangie now, uh, moving you on. We're going to be heading west. I still have to do Never Reach Red Week. We're going west. Go uh, west. Where so Pival yeah. went. Um, Life and is gonna... peaceful there. Exactly. <laughs> there you are. Um, we're going to head over to Isla, um, where they uh, peat a lot of their whiskey. So, um, Anyone who has signed up um, for this tasting and thinks they don't like smoky whiskey, give these two a go. See what you think. So we're heading over to Ardbeg, which is one of my personal favourites and somewhere we probably all would have been at the end of this month if it hadn't have been for the lockdown for the yeah, Isla yeah. Festival. Yeah. But what, what we can definitely say, Becky, is that even although Ardbeg Day is not physically happening per se, at the distillery, there's certainly going to be a big celebration with some nice surprises for our Ardbeg guests. Oh, look forward to that. Can you give us any uh, hints as to what's happening for Ardbeg Day? Which is uh, which day is that, Bill? Is that the 30th? It's either the 30th or the 1st of June. I can't quite, yeah, I'm not a number. Think. I think it's 30th, 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 yeah. But, you know, not only will people be able yeah, to get an introduction to this year's Ardbeg Day, there might be one or two uh, guest speakers reminiscing about their favourite whiskies, uh, Ardbeg Day whiskies in the past. Mm -hmm. And at least, at least two of these guest speakers are devastatingly handsome. <laughs> and, or and, deluded. <laughs> and, and maybe Brendan and I will be there as well. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Guys, um, I mean, our, our big day for me is always one of the highlights of the Isla Festival. It's the closing day of the festival. So every distillery has an open day um, throughout an entire week. And Ardbeg always pulls out the stops and put on a, the a themed party of some sort. I think uh, I didn't go last year, but the year before was the Summer of Love when you had Ardbeg Grooves. And for me, yes. one of the highlights was um, sitting in uh, Mickey Heads' garden. Uh, so he had a house on at the distillery. I think he's actually moved now, but um, that house is one of my favourite spots in the entire world. It just looks out across the coast there. It's right next to the distillery and just sitting in that back garden surrounded by um, fake flowers that they'd put <laughs> all <laughs> everywhere. Uh, and Mickey Heads wearing this like um, headband of flowers and like hippie t-shirt and big pink glasses. And we yeah. tasted some extraordinary whiskey, some really old, lovely, lovely art bag. Yeah. That you, you do know, <laughs> Becky, that was not Mickey dressing up for the day. That's how he normally dresses. <laughs> I got the gist. He seemed very comfortable. <laughs> and it was it was a, a very rare occurrence of some beautiful sunshine as well, which is not just rare for Isla, but rare for Scotland. I think I think the uh, co-op at Bamor ran out of uh, sun cream that year. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Right, let's move on to uh, whiskey number four. Are we popping back to Brendan for this one? We are indeed. Ah, Brendan. So, <clears throat> we're now going to try Ardbeg 10. So before we try the whiskey, and I can hear everyone going off for God's sake, I want to drink the whiskey. Start drinking if you want to, but just before I jump into this tasting, just to bring a few things to life for what makes Ardbeg distillery so special. So it is this incredibly smoky single malt scotch on an island that is full of incredibly smoky single malt scotch distilleries. Um, Ardbeg shares a coastline with Laphroaig and Lagavulin. These iconic sort of smoke monsters are on the Coldalton coast on the south coast of Isla. And it really is just something a bit special. So we have 
intensely smoked peat, uh, intensely smoked barley, I should say, lots of peat on the barley. You're looking at 55 parts per million phenols and up if you're obsessed with those numbers. But I think Bill, as well as I would encourage you, don't, don't obsess over the number of uh, the, the phenols, but it's how you treat those intensely smoked batches of barley that come to the, the site. Uh, when we mash, we, we ferment in wooden washbacks. And when you have wooden washbacks, it just means that each fermentation starts off with a little bit of something from the previous fermentation left behind. So it makes it a little bit funky. It makes it a little bit soapy. It makes it a kind of crazy, waxy, dank texture that comes through in your hard bags. And then during distillation, we have a fairly unique style of distillation. So we have a purifier on our spirit still. It's just this, this little just this little bit of extra copper that returns some of the distillate on the spirit still distillation adds a little bit of copper polishes things a little uh, and really all i would say is the purifier just gives you like an opportunity to look through the smoke and try and find some other flavors that are in each art bag that you try so the most famous art bag i would say is the one that i have right here is art bag 10 and I don't know for definite, but I'm about 99.99% sure that this is my favourite art bag of all time. Um, but I, I'll, I'll, I'm on the fence, 99.99% on the fence, but on the fence. But what I can tell you is my, so you're always asked, what's your favourite whiskey? You're always asked that when you work in the whiskey industry. And it's impossible to answer, it's impossible. But I can say that probably my most memorable enjoyable and unadvisable experiences ever was drinking an art bag. So I used to live on Isla. I lived on Isla for three years, but I worked for the enemy. So I used to work for a different company, but I, part of my job was I used to run two distilleries, but also I made a lot of heavily smoked barley and would sell it to various distilleries, including our big. So while I was on that island, I lived on Isla, which has 2,900 people, and I was but a Brendan, single if man. Don't, if you don't mind me interrupting you just for a second, you're being very modest there. You were running Kalila Lagavulin Distilleries and Port Ellen Maltings. You know, you, you had a big job there. So you yeah. were running the maltings that was supplying our Ardbeg distillery. Sorry. I'll... Yeah, that's true. I also had a full head of hair and a clean driving license. Don't I was believe a catch. it. Don't believe it. <laughs> wait, wait. Was, was that a nice comment that you made about Brendan there, Bill? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't get Thank used you. to it, pal. Okay. Get it, get it written down. Someone, <laughs> someone screen grab. Someone screen yeah. grab this. This is recorded. You can replay Nikki, it. That, that was 2020's nice comment about Brendan, okay? <laughs> no, but thank you, Bill. Thank you. But when I lived on Isla, I was there on my own. So I was a single man. So uh, I took up running. Um, and the first big run that I ever did was on Isla. And was there a lot of marathon. happy sheep? When you were a single man there with a lot of happy sheep in Isla, Brendan. I can tell my sheep story as well, where there was right. one day I came home for lunch right. and I got a feeling asking. that someone was in my house and there was a sheep in my house, which I had to drag outside. And as I dragged the sheep outside, some of the football team drove past. Wasn't a good look. <laughs> <laughs> it was completely innocent. Where the lipstick and the earrings came from, I'll never know. But... Guys, guys, this is really entertaining. This is <laughs> Carry but on. if you run, if you run the Isla Half Marathon now, Bill's run it, and I've, I've run it. it. Well, I've run it. I was supposed to, but then I got shin splints. I can, but I was there. Uh, I got so that's I know, slight, slightly different, Becky. But you know, yeah, yeah we've all ran it. We've all, <laughs> and <laughs> Bill and I have also ran it with probably the worst preparation in that we were a little bit hungover. Am I allowed to say that? It's too late. Yes. We we're slightly yeah. hungover. Yeah. Um, but I ran it and I finished. It was my first half marathon and I was exhausted, like absolutely spent. And you go down the hill at Bowmore from the round church and the finish line's right there. And you think, thank God, this it's just momentum taking me down this bloody hill. And you finish and Mickey Heads cheered me over the line because our beg sponsor it. And he went, Brendan, are you all right? And I went, Mickey, I'm dying. I'm dying. I need, a, I need something to drink. And he went, I'll help you out. So away he went and I was expecting a lovely big bottle of cold water. And Mickey gave me a glass of our big ten. <laughs> so maybe not the most advisable thing, but I will never forget how nice that drama whiskey was. So I think it's my favourite whiskey ever, but you can never be certain. But it's definitely the whiskey that I most remember drinking. Something beautiful. How was your half marathon, Bill? Was it similar to mine? Um, 
I, I'm guessing, yes, it was in that um, I had hopelessly underprepared for it. And I think I had run maybe as much as seven miles in my practice. And I will never forget. And I ran it with the former distillery manager, Stuart Thompson. And I'll never forget getting down the bottom of the hill near uh, Isla International Aerodrome. And you turn right heading back to Bowmore. Mm -hmm. And firstly, I was hit by the wind. And then I saw this road disappearing into the horizon. Yeah, the and I thought, <laughs> Billy boy, what on earth are you doing here? So <laughs> it was a, a very painful experience. But the most painful part of it all for me was, and bear in mind, I was, that was about 15 years ago, when I got over the line at the Bowmore Distillery and checked my time, my time was two hours, one minute and 37 seconds. So I just missed breaking the two hour, which really, really, really pissed me off. And I was a bad mood for the rest of the night. <laughs> and I never <laughs> ran it again. <laughs> Well, it's a weird half marathon though isn't it the, I mean, the year yeah. that I sort of did it didn't really do it um, yeah. it was like four seasons in one day you've got yeah. like this yeah. thing hot sunshine and then the hailstones come in and then you get the wind and then you get the rain and then it's gorgeous sunshine again and you just yeah. Yeah. can't quite prepare yourself for yeah. everything that's and blown at you because it's just 80% it's yeah, eighty percent of the run is uphill as well because my cousin had an iPhone. This is how long ago it was. He was very trendy with an iPhone, and it measured it, and it's eighty percent uphill. Yeah. So, yeah. that didn't do it then. Yeah, you know, but, I'd love to say to our, our listeners tonight, I can thoroughly recommend running the uh, the Ardbeg Isla <laughs> Half Marathon, but I won't because I can't recommend it. <laughs> it's just the party afterwards. Fun. Party afterwards is amazing. So our big ten, our big ten, remember what we talked about earlier. So you, you give it a swirl. Before you know it, have a look at the colour because the colour is going to give you an idea of what you're going to taste. The colour is going to give you an idea of what to expect. Not in this case. Not in this case. Our big is very paradoxical. And with our big ten, I mean, look at that. It almost looks like a glass of white burgundy. You know, it just looks like something that's going to be austere, gentle, elegant, beautiful, maybe light, maybe the flavours will take a while to come out of the glass and then just give it that little swirl and get your nose in there. And you're like, wow, <laughs> wow, that 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 was a change of pace from the colour to the aroma is black and white, it's night and day. It's just salty, smoky, it's got iodine, it's got um, wood fires, it's got like a trip to the hospital, it's got antiseptic throat lozenges, TCP, everything's in there. Go back and take another little aroma before we taste, Aro take another aroma. You're starting to get used to the smoke now, okay? It hasn't just smacked you in the face this time. There's something else in there. I, I don't think I get it on the nose, but you just get, yeah, it's big and smoky, but there's something else under there. Mm. So... Take a little sip now, and like Bill said, hold it on your palate for a second or a couple of seconds, nothing too long, and then take a swallow and start thinking about how this how this whiskey develops. That's a big whiskey, Brendan. It really is. It, it, yeah, the, the, the colour tells you a, a, a small whiskey, doesn't it? The, the colour tells you something maybe easy to approach and something uh, inviting, and instead you get something that's, like you say, Bill, just big. It's so big and it's so bold and it's so smoky. Um, we, have, we have a question actually about about that colour. So um, yeah. it's, it's lovely and pale. So um, Stephen Murray has asked, why is it so pale and yeah. pale? The reason for that. So this is the ten year old, so, and it obviously looks very very different to um, the Glenmorangie uh, original, which is also ten. So Bill is okay to answer. Or? Absolutely, because you yep. know the answer. Okay, so th 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 there is an answer to it. There's an answer because it's 10 years in export bin casks and people ask, you know, why is it spilled? And there is an answer to it, but we don't actually know what that answer is. We just know that it's pale and we don't really care. It just has this incredible paradoxical nature, Arbeg. I think part of it is just it's such a severe... A raw spirit is such a big, bold, smoky spirit made in such a particular way. 
a I, little I think, bit of it is the balance of casks that we use yeah, and a little it, bit of it is a maturation profile but it's yeah. it's just something that makes it distinctive yeah there's a smaller proportion of first fill X bourbons in the recipe, and there is refill X bourbons. Whereas for Glen Morangy original, it's mainly first fills and some second fills. So it's as simple as that. I just noticed Becky and the the little banner along the bottom that flashed up there. It said that the whiskey is forty percent. It's forty six percent. Forty six. Oh, sorry. Or is, that, or is that my bad eyesight again? <laughs> no, that's probably me making a mistake. Sorry, 46. There yeah. you go. Well done. Good spot. 46%. Yeah, it's been, pretty I've impressive. Been to a in the post. Yeah. Good vision. Yeah. So it's 46%. It's non chill filtered. It's the most uninterrupted whiskey. It's raw. It's intense. It's smoky. But take a couple of sips and you're going to find it also has. Like this, this balance, it has all that smoke, but underneath the smoke, if you can fight your way through it, you're looking for acidity, you're looking for lime juice, you're looking for something sharp yep. and tangy and citrusy, and it just, some people won't get it, but if you stick, stick with it, try two, three, four sips, it cuts through the smoke, and you just get this wonderful balance, and also it's like this great kind of, um, warm pavements and mineralic, you know, dry stone kind of flavour that comes through as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Rachel, Rachel Dixon says it gets so viscous and thick. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, Stephen Murray has said it it's super powerful, but adding a splash of water makes it easier to drink. So mm -hmm. I think actually if, you know, if the peated whiskey isn't to everybody's taste, then it can be quite um, overpowering on a palate, yeah. particularly if you are used to drinking maybe lighter space -like style whiskies. So if you do try a peated whiskey and it's a little bit too much, then adding a drop of water can just help um with your females and just, just uh, what what's what's space aid, Becky? Just heard that word there. <laughs> uh somewhere that's supposed to be having a festival right now as well, <laughs> apparently, if you didn't know. Well, although it might is it finished now? I'm totally out of the loop. I don't even know what day is it? <laughs> is there such a thing as a weekend? Yeah. <laughs> yes, but Becky, what year is it? <laughs> Who knows? It's but yeah, our big ten. I, I think it is my favourite. I think it is my favourite. Our big. You can never be sure, but I just love the the, the rawness. If I had mm. one word to describe our big ten, it's it's raw, and I love it. Yeah. Um, that, that's a, go a good intro for me for the, the next whiskey, I think, that rawness. Or is there a, a couple of questions there, Becky, I can see flashing up? No, that's just a note from George Keeble saying he remembers a wheelbarrow of Pete being lugged around Isla on the uh, half marathon several years ago. That might yeah. be on the same one, George. I don't remember. Yeah. It, was actually a fella, it was a fella called Pete who had to get put in the wheelbarrow <laughs> to get him back to the finish line. <laughs> Uh, we do need, yeah. I, you know, we do need to move on to the next whiskey. We are starting to run out of time. So, um, whiskey number five is it's the Mighty Ardbeg Anno, which was the first uh, new whiskey we've had in the core range for many, many years. And you know, this was a, a very challenging project to work on. And it's also very topical for Brendan because it was one of the first Ardbeg projects you worked on with me as well, Brendan. And when I, I say a challenge, um, it was kind of kicked off by the company, the Glenmorangie company's former CEO. So our last CEO who joined me in my sensory lab one day and he, he said, Bill, um, I've got a little bit of a problem with Ardbeg. And I said, oh, oh really? OK, tell me more. And he said that he, he finds the he found the 10 year old just too raw and salty, as Brendan said there. He said, I like the sweetness of Ugadal, but it's a little bit too strong uh, in alcohol strength for me. And he said, frankly, Bill, I find Corey Vrecken just totally terrifying. So he said, what advice would you give me? And, you know, I answered him immediately. I said, Mark, that's quite easy. Drink Glenmorangie. But that's not what he was wanting to hear from me. And so it led to an idea to try and develop an Ardbeg whiskey, which would appeal 
to art bag consumers, to Isla whiskey lovers, but actually maybe be uh, have a little bit of appeal for to people who up to that stage had been afraid of drinking Isla whiskey. So that's where it all started from. And, you know, myself and Brendan and Gillian and the rest of the guys in the team, we worked on this project probably for between two to three years, trying various different recipes. Now, happily, I had quite a portfolio of casks to draw from because when I moved from being Glenmorangie Distillery Manager into kind of the predecessor of the current role I do, I experimented by filling a lot of different cask types at both Glenmorangie and Ardbeg. So, you know, I, I had a wide choice of bourbon barrels, of sherry casks, different types of sherry, new charred oak, lots of different things in there. So eventually we, we narrowed it down to one or two potential recipes and then finally chose one recipe that we felt kind of ticked the box in terms of maybe being a slightly more gentle art bag. But for me, there was something missing and I, I just couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. And after a very rare good night sleep, because I'm a bit of an insomniac, I don't sleep very well, I woke up with this idea, and it was quite simple, go back to use a very old-fashioned whiskey blender's technique of marrying. So the recipe for Anno has bourbon barrels, it has refill bourbon barrels, it has Pedro Jimenez sherry casks, it has new charred oak casks, and it has a scattering of a few other cask types in there. So we installed at the 11th hour large, very, very old French oak marrying vats. And when I say old, what I mean by that is that the wood is no longer active, so it doesn't actually directly contribute flavours itself, but it's very porous as French oak is compared to American oak, and it lets the whiskey breathe. So the recipe for an oak goes into the main marrying vat, and it sits in there for a minimum of three months, usually three to six months, and that period just integrates and knits all of the component parts together. And that was the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And it just gave the, the, the Ardbeg Anno whiskey that little bit of softness and creaminess, which I think Mark, the former CEO, was looking for. The name, as we always have with Ardbeg, it's a bit of fun. It's named after the, the large round peninsula at the southwest tip of the island of Isla. And Brendan, as someone, a former resident of Isla, I've got my geography right there. It's the southwest tip. Yep. And the O, or the Mull of O, kind of protects the south coast of the island from the Atlantic winds and the Atlantic storms. And of course, the south coast is where the big three distilleries are. Lafroig, Lagavulin, and Ardbeg all right next door to each other. So the idea is that the marrying vats at the distillery do the same job as the mull of O, and it kind of softens and protects the intensity of the whiskey. And I know, I know, there's a little bit of BS in there, but it's a fun story, and that's why we called it an O. We tasted, that's it, there, there's the, the, the mull of O there on the bottom left-hand corner. Thanks for putting that up, Becky. We, we tasted this whiskey at almost every strength from 57% right down to 40%. Now, we probably were not going to go down as low as 40 because the whiskey would have, have to be chill filtered at that. And we finally, finally settled on 46.6% as being the ideal combination to give a softness but a nice delicious flavour. So this next whiskey, Ardbeg, I know, on the nose, again, guess what? This is not in Morangy. You're getting these lovely, soft, smoky flavours. And it's quite interesting that the phenolic compounds you get from the burning of the peat, they have a relatively high odour threshold. 
So you don't necessarily pick them up so much on the nose, but my goodness, they've got a low flavour threshold and you really, really get it on the palate. So I am once again going to get the old serpent out, just cut it with a little bit of water. And once I've done that, I always find this curious top note in Ardbeg which Brendan talked about in the 10-year-old as being like lime juice. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it's like fennel. And sometimes it's a bit more like pine resin. But I always find that that's the unique marker for Ardbeg. And if I'm ever tasting whiskies blind, that's how I can tell Ardbeg from some of the other fine whiskies made on the island of Isla. Whew. That was quite a lot of information I fired at people there. <laughs> really? So, Bill, would you say it's, it's smokier than 10? Because that's sometimes a debate that comes out. Yeah. Um, I, I would say no, it's not. Because, as you know, Bre Brendan, the malted barley we use for making our bag is all officially peated to the same level. But, you know, it's a very inexact science peating, so you're never going to get bang on 55 or 60 or 80 ppm. Mm -hmm. So, by and large, it's made with the same malted barley as the 10-year-old. But I think the use of the Pedro Jimenez sherry cask, the new charred oak, and the marrying vats have just slightly toned down the intensity of the peat. So I, I need to take a sip of this now, actually. And how, how, how old is Anna? Are you able to, to give any indication? I know it's a no age statement, which means yep. that they don't, you don't have to put the age on the on the bottle. But roughly how long has it spent yep. maturing in cask? It has a range of ages in there, Becky. But, you know, if you worked out the average age of Anna, and, and Technically, you're not allowed to do that in the world of Scotch whisky. You have to state the age of the youngest whisky in the mix there. But if you worked out the average age, we'd be looking at about eight or nine, so something slightly below the 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of age, as you probably know, Becky, we are just about to release a new, very young Ardbeg, which we're proudly putting the number five on the wee beastie age statement. So this is, this is a bit older than that. Mm. But what I got in the taste there is that it does have that. It's altogether silkier and creamier. And the smoke is much more integrated into the rest of the flavour profile. And I'll never forget that when I launched this product out in Asia, we had a big consumer tasting event in Tokyo, in Japan. And a lot of the consumers who, who attended that event came up to me and said, Bill, we really love Ano, we really like it, but it's a little bit tamer than the 10-year-old. And I thought, hallelujah, that's what we were trying to do with this. So I know, if you like, is the gentler side of Ardbeg. Mm -hmm. I think that's coming through from a lot of the comments that we've had as well. I and mean, we just had one from Graham Fraser who said, um, certainly getting the wood, but restrained peat on the nose, which is yeah. obviously what you're, you're trying to do. And with all those yeah. different types of yeah. wood that you're using there, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, we've got from, from Tabitha, who's tasting that I love. Um, she has uh, malt, molasses, smoked ham, pineapple cubes, cola, spearmint and peanut. Yeah, yeah Tabitha is sounding like competition. So I think we're going to have yeah. to have her like, taken out. <laughs> Yeah, Ta Ta you know, I, I'm Too loving good. some of Tabitha's savoury notes in there because I think we said, Brendan, on the official tasting notes of Anno that we picked up something that reminded us of grilled artichokes. Mm. <laughs> no matter how ridiculous that sounds, but there is something vegetal and savoury in there. It's true. Guys, it's true. guys, we've got, because these two have rattled on for bloody ages, we're running out of time. So if you've got any questions that you want to put to these guys, and then put it in a comment now. I'll see yeah. how many we can get through. Maybe we we'll ha might have to do quick fire because uh, we like we know how much these two have to do. Right? Just we can do a lightning round. Like a oh, lightning round. Exactly. So I, I have a question. I'm going to kick off while people yeah. put all of their questions in. Um, Really exciting news that came from you guys. Um, was it earlier this year or the end of last year? Um, about a new um, experimental distillery that's being added on to Glenmorangie, which is so exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this came from the same former CEO, Becky. And I went to him one day and said, I, I was bored. And, you know, I was lying. I wasn't bored in any way, shape or form. But I, I was on a mission and I asked him to give me some money to build a new distillery. And he thought about it and he said, well, starting a completely new brand takes a long time. So he said, how about I give you the amount you asked for minus X and you do something at Glenmorangie. So Project Lighthouse, as we call it, is what came out of that. And while we have done many, many interesting experimental things at both Glenmorangie and Ardbeg, there are some things that we wanted to do that we simply couldn't do. So that's why we've built this new distillery, which will help us innovate. Now, the, 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 the Lighthouse Distillery, and it's a project which Brendan has actually been managing, it can produce classic Glenmorangie. It's got two full-size Glenmorangie stills, but they've got bells and whistles added on to it. So if Brendan and I have our way, it will never, ever, ever be used to make classic Glenmorangie. So the current crisis has stopped the, the building program there and we were planning and opening this roundabout now. So it's yeah. been slightly delayed and we'll announce the new opening date within the next couple of months or so. Brendan, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, th I think you've you've answered it perfectly. It's, it's just, it just gives us time and the levers to play in any way that we want to. So we're, we are super innovative right now. Um, but this is, it just lets us do so much more spirit led innovations, gives us a chance what, what, to like. What's a lever, Brendan? Is that something you find in the United States of America? We've got levers so. here in Scotland. <laughs> Says the man who talks about novels, <laughs> <laughs> novels of Ian Fleming and films. And films. 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 Um, we, have, actually, we have a question from uh, a few, uh, your future blender, Tabitha, um, who has asked, this has come up a few times actually, would Ardbeg ever experiment with a non-peated expression? Well, Yep, um, I mean, we, we have done. We've had a number of expressions over the years. We, we had Ardbeg Blazda, which was very lightly peated. So, Tabitha, yes, we do have one or two casks of unpeated Ardbeg in the stock profile. The challenge we have is that there's so much peat smoke everywhere in the distillery that even the casks of unpeated Ardbeg have a frisson of, of peatiness about them. But yes, we, we, we have done that and there may well be some releases in the future. Good. Um, I think maybe just one last question. I'm not sure whether it's a question or a tasting note. <laughs> Andrew Budge wants to know, chicken or beef? Well, I, I'm no. quite greedy, so I like both. It depends what mood I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> it's like surf and turf, but if you can replace the fish with a chicken, then I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. No, well, uh, Andrew, I'm I'm vegetarian. I will answer that and say I'm good. I'll, I'll have yours as well. Just order it and uh, I'll eat it. I'll, I'll have both, and then I can, I just can clean up. Do <laughs> the washing up after. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ch challenge those stereotypical ginger rolls. Yeah. So, so <laughs> Becky, do we have time for the Bill and Ben joke? Oh no no, okay. no 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 no, oh, no. no. Alarm, not going alarm, there. alarm we're not going there we're not going there poor bill's gone bright red bless him <laughs> <laughs> um guys okay look that leaves me to thank absolutely everyone for um coming along bill brendan ardberg everyone who's behind the brands thank you so much for um presenting your whiskies um allowing us to taste through them as well this has been uh, eye-opening, uh, wonderful, and I hope everybody who's been watching along has um, discovered something new, maybe wants to go away and buy a bottle. Um, as I mentioned, I'll put links to where you can find all those bottles in the comments at the end of the video. So if you want to go and have a look up uh, any bottles you want to purchase, you can do so there. Um, 
Thank you as well. Big shout out to Claxton's and to the Dram team for um, helping me put this together. It has been, um, as you probably would have known from getting uh, your tasting pack, it's a labour of love and um, a very um, big DIY project. But um, thankfully, uh, you know, we are, I've had a lot of help with this and we've put together a, a tasting series that is raising a lot of money for the Drinks Trust charity. Um, so helping a lot of people who are in need at the moment. Um, Bill, Brendan, thank you so much for your help. Thank you. Um, and thank you. yeah, hope to see you at a whiskey festival soon yeah. or maybe running that Isla Half Marathon again. Um, mm. along the way. I'm in. I'm in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I'm in for the whiskey festival, not necessarily the half marathon. Brent, Brendan, <laughs> maybe you can push him along in that wheelbarrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Right, thank, thank you very so much, much Becky. Thank you so much. Cheers. Right. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you so much to everybody for um, joining us for the festival. I really appreciate it. Um, let us know in your comments which were your favourite whiskies. Um, really want to hear about everything you've been um, tasting and what you think of them. Um, join us again for uh, next week's uh, tasting, which is on Thursday the 14th of May at 6pm again. So same place, same time, just different day. Um, and then we have our final one on the 21st of May as well. If you've liked this, then please share it with all your friends. Please share it on your social media. Like and follow us and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You never know, there may be more to come from our whiskey at some point. So um, please uh, follow us. Um, great. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see you all again soon. Um, take care, stay safe, keep well. And uh, let's all have a dram again when we're at the other side of all this. Bye. <laughs>